Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. This month, we come to you from Washington, D.C. at NIAF's 44th Anniversary Gala. We met up with Marianne Esposito, one of our stars for Italian-American cuisine, and also with Lou Del Bianco, who spoke to us about his grandfather, Luigi Del Bianco, chief carver of Mount Rushmore. Now let's go to Marianne Esposito. It's just wonderful to be back here with NIAF again. You know, Ciao Italia, yes, is now in its 29th season on public television. And the mission statement of NIAF is the same as the mission statement of Ciao Italia, to preserve traditional, regional Italian recipes to promote Italy in an absolutely positive way and to preserve our heritage for future generations. So I can't think of a better partnership than Ciao Italia and NIAF. And you each have received tonight my latest cookbook, Ciao Italia, My Lifelong Food Adventures in Italy, which covers basically 29 years of travel in Italy to almost every region except Friuli, but that's on my list. Marianne Esposito, welcome to Italics. Thank you, it's good to be here. How did you get started um, in cooking? As I understand it, it's, you just sort of fell into it. Um, well, you know, I really didn't like cooking. <laughs> you really have to know the truth. Uh, I grew up in an Italian-American family in western New York, and I had two grandmothers who were in the food business, and my mother was a dietitian. And uh, so we were always cooking, you know, and it was always in volume. You know, Italians never do anything that's just one or two things. And I grew to really dislike doing things like singeing feathers off of chickens and putting up plum tomatoes all summer long and, you know, peaches and that kind of thing. So I went in a different direction. And I wanted to go to college and be a teacher. And that's what I did. I went to college. I became a, a high school history teacher. And it wasn't until I really made my very first trip to Italy in um, 1984, I think it was, that the light bulb went on when I saw everything that was around me, the people, the culture, the food, the art. I remembered all the things that my grandmothers had told me about Italy. And I thought, wow, I really have a special heritage. I'm, I'm going to get serious about this now. So when I came back, I uh, enrolled at the university and I studied Italian and I got a master's degree in Italian history and bingo, that was it. Then I started in on the food and here I am 29 years later still doing our show. You did your master thesis on Renaissance cooking, is that correct? Yes, I had to translate these really ancient Italian manuscripts, you know, and the language was very different then. It wasn't the language of Dante, the Tuscan Italian. So I would do, I would translate these recipes and I'd bring them into the professor and he'd taste them and he'd go, this is god awful. You know, because you have to remember during that time things were heavily spiced, they were heavy. Um, yeah, so I, I did my uh, thesis on that and that gave me a better picture of what food was like during that that particular time. You talk about Italian cuisine regionally, whereas some people just say Italian cuisine, and it, it, so many things seem to get lost. It's true, because when I did my very first show, the very first show I did, which was in 1989, I made the statement that there is no such thing as Italian food. And I stand by that statement today. There is no such thing as Italian food. There's only Italian regional food. And so our show has been devoted to the 20 regions of Italy that all cook very differently using the ingredients that are particular to those regions. And so that's been the mission, you know. Let's get as authentic as we can with the, we, I know we live in America and we can't get all of the products that you would find if you were in Italy, but we certainly have some of them. And you can get close to authenticity, but you want to keep it real. You know, like spaghetti and meatballs. People look at me and think, well, why isn't that in your cookbook? Because it's an Italian-American dish. Basically, your dozen or so books all deal with regional cooking. Everything deals with regional cooking, but my very first cookbook really dealt with a lot of family of recipes that Italian-American carry over where, you know, one foot was in Italy and one foot was in America. So that was, that cookbook kind of spurred me on to, wait a minute now, there's more to this than that. Yeah. So yes, so as I've gone through the years, of course, I've learned so much more about Italian regional food and that, that's reflected in my books. Yeah, this idea of things being different, I really like because you, 
you nicely flatten everything out, that there's no hierarchy, not one better than the other, they're just different. And I want to ask you about then Italian, quote unquote, regional food and Italian American food. Well, uh, Italian American food, um, you know, is, is just kind of a, a play on what the real thing is. For instance, I always tell people, now when you're traveling in Italy, don't ask for things that you would have at home. Go with what the locals eat. Look at a menu. Don't eat in the center square because most of those restaurants are going to cater to tourists and they know. Tourists don't want, they don't want bisteca with arugula on top of it. You know, they just want a steak with french fries. I said, well, then you could just stay home if you're going to ask yeah. for that. You know, that's my answer. Yeah. But if you're going to be really authentic, you, you know, every cookbook that I write comes very close to the authenticity, but it will never be authentic. No cookbook could ever, ever have an authentic, truly authentic Italian recipe because you can't get all of these ingredients. Yes, you can get olive oils from the different regions of Italy. You can get pasta. You can get imported cheeses, Parmigiano, Reggiano, Pecorino, uh, you know, Asiago. You can get these things. You can't get some of the meat products. You can't grow the exact same vegetables. You can get the seeds and you can put them in your garden and get something that's very close, but you don't have the same terroir. Right. So it's we're coming very close, and I don't make I don't make any bones about that. I'm showing you how you should cook Italian regional food using as many of those food products that are possible. I live in New York City. Real Italian food, quote unquote. You know, we hear that all the time. There are these restaurateurs who have come from Italy in the last 20, 30, 40 years who do, quote unquote, authentic Italian. Even if they're coming from Italy, they have to adapt because they're bound by the same rules everybody else is. You want to get mortadella from Italy? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, right? yeah. Because we have rules in this country. But over the 29 years, I really, I have learned so much about Italian regional cooking. There's so much to learn. People say to me, well, you know, this is your 13th cookbook. What else could you possibly say? And I say a lot because that's just the tip of the iceberg when you think about the history of Italy when you think about the fact that Italy was not a country until 1861 right until then it was all these little individual divided divided states that just did their own thing mm -hmm. well if you delve into the history of all of these regions that's a lifetime of work because besides the recipe that I put in the book I want you to know why is that recipe called that you know why is it called mal tagliati? Why, why, why is pasta called mal tagliati? Where does that come from? How is it made? Why is it different from what we've got? Yeah. So all of this takes time. It takes a lot of research. Mm. What are some of your favorite dishes from the different regions you think that you really like? If you go home and say, I think I'm going to have this, boom. Well, one of my very favorite yeah. dishes is the timbalo. Uh -huh. The timbalo di melanzane, a bucatini, yeah. which is a southern Italian dish. Um, Naples, Sicily, you know, when um, Naples, Sicily were united under the kingdom of the two Sicilies, that food kind of spilt over. They, they all share that similar cuisine. So if I was dying, that would be the dish that I would ask for, the timbalo, because it's very impressive. Yeah. And it's also written about in uh, uh, Giuseppe Lampedusa's book, The Leopard. The Leopard. So if you exactly. read The Leopard, you know, Don Fabrizio is talking about this beautiful pasticcio or this timbalo that comes in the dining room and it's a genie of flavors and smoke wafting out of it. So that that would be uh, absolutely, yeah. and of course, the porchetta from Umbria. Yes. The porchetta, is, there's, you know, again, can we duplicate it here? No, no way, because the pork is different. You know, how it's raised is different. So much of what happens in Italy is, is artisanal in the sense that it comes from small locales, as opposed to the way we function in this country. Everything is on this industrial commercial scale. So it's treated differently, right? And one of the things I do each year is I take a group to Italy to cook in a region. So that last year I took a group to Tuscany, but I've taken them all over, Lombardia, to the Veneto, to Sicilia, to Basilicata, places where a lot of Americans don't go because when they think about going to Italy, they think about the big three, Venice, Florence, and Rome. And yes, those are musts. But to me, even though there's so much history surrounding those areas, if you get away from that, the really real Italy is in the smaller regions. 
Yeah. You know, like Molise, for instance, who we're honoring who's tonight. Being honoring here, yeah. right. How about these films about Italian food oh, when you watch that. them? <laughs> you know what my favorite is? Big Night. Yeah, he'll have the meatballs. Well, um, the spaghetti comes without meatballs. There are no meatballs with the spaghetti? No, sometimes spaghetti likes to be alone. I've seen Big Night I don't know how many times. And you know, I often think that when, I, when people go to see this movie, I hate to say this, but I think sometimes if you're not Italian, you don't get it at the beginning. When you have Primo and Secundo, the brothers' names, and you say, oh, wait a second, that's the pattern to an Italian meal. You know, Primo, the pre yeah. first course, and Secundo, the second yeah. course. But that's one of my favorites. I also liked A Beautiful Life. Okay. That was great. Um, Il Postino, mm -hmm. that was a wonderful one. Have you seen um, Dinner Rush, the movie Dinner Rush? Oh, is it new? It's not new. It's a movie that unfortunately back in 2000 got lost in one of these distribution oh, debacles. Whereas Big Night is more, let's say, traditional quote unquote Italian food, even though it's all of yeah. its own type. Yeah. Dinner Rush goes beyond. And so it's, it's, it's not trying to be authentic, quote unquote, but it's a type of nouveau Italian cuisine. I'm a real traditionalist, and my, uh, my aim, my goal, is to really preserve those recipes that are gonna be lost to time. Because just, I see the parallel happening in our country and in Italy. The younger generation, they're not, you know, they're not making ziti. They're not doing what the Nonas did. They're too busy. They've, yeah. they've got busy lives. So there's no Zia home making pasta anymore. Or if she is, you know, she's almost going to be a dinosaur. And so I want to preserve these. So what I've done is I've started a legacy library online, uh. which is part of my foundation. I have a foundation that's set up to help culinary students, potential culinary yes. students, and uh, who are very serious about studying regional Italian food and they are matriculating in a program, a, a degree program. So it's twofold. The foundation does that, the scholarships, and also this legacy library will be set up online for anyone so that future generations can go there. You want to know how to make pasta con sarde and nobody makes it? Go online, there it is. You want to know how to make a, a classic pandoro from a Verona? You can find it. So all of these recipes that will, you know, eventually they will be lost. Food studies has really become popular in the last yeah. two decades or yeah. so. Yeah. And I think we have to recognize those of you who were out there doing some of the groundwork by bringing back the recipes, by going to Italy as you do, by writing about it, et cetera, et cetera. You and doing the regional stuff, because I think that's really important, that fact. And, and, and so I just want to say, Hats off to you for that. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. It's really been a lot of fun. I've been telling stories for about 34 years, but this story is very important to me because it's about somebody in my family. It's about my nonno, my grandpa. That's me, Lou. And that's my grandfather, Luigi. I was my grandfather's only grandson and his namesake. And in the Italian culture, as you know, that is a very big deal. And uh, so we obviously had a very special bond, even though I did not know him long. He was Luigi Del Bianco, and he was the chief carver, the master carver on this, the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. It's in the orange-colored state called South Dakota. There are four presidents who are honored on the Shrine of Democracy. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. My grandpa was born in Italy in 1892, in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, way up north, uh, where, between Venice and Trieste. And in 1910, my grandfather, when he was 18, he wanted to come to America to carve something special. He makes several trips from Italy to America. He settles in 1910 in Barry, Vermont, as a memorial stone carver. He returns in 1915 to fight with the Italian army, which many immigrants did. He returns to Barry in 1920 after the war, and then is surreptitiously introduced to Guts and Borglum, the genius sculptor who tried to figure out how to carve 60-foot faces in the side of a mountain. 
It is 1933 when Borglum realizes he needs serious trained hands to refine these faces. So he hires my grandfather in 1933. My grandfather has the most important job on the mountain, carving the refinement of expression. When you see the humanity and the soul in these faces, that is from the hands of my grandpa and that is a fact. So let's take a little trip back in time, everyone. This is Mount Rushmore the way you know it. I'm going to show you Mount Rushmore in 1936. Look at the little boxes on Washington's face. Those are scaffolds that the men would stand in so they wouldn't fall to their death. I'm happy to tell you nobody died while working on Mount Rushmore. And there's my grandpa, my nonno, Luigi, in the studio, the proud artist with the models of the four faces. So let's imagine that Luigi is in the studio and he's measuring the eye of Abraham Lincoln. And as he measures the eye, he likes to have a little conversation with his favorite president. It might go something like this. President Lincoln, buongiorno. You are in the studio of the genius, Mr. Guts in Borlum. Amici, every day, the master and me, we try to find the best way to measure the small face and move that measurement to the big face on La Montagna. The mountain. You see, in the morning, I measure the small eye. In the afternoon, I carve the big eye. Eh? Sono io, Luigi. I am carving the big eye of the president. The sun beats my head so hot, and the scaffold shakes from the wind. I feel I'm going to fall out. And when I carve the eye, I do it 500 feet in the air. 706 steps, amici, è vero, every day, up and down, up and down. It's like halfway up the Empire State Building. I miss my wife, Nicoletta. I miss my sons, Silvio, Cesare, Vincenzo. So I bring them with me to South Dakota to live with me while I carve the faces. My boys, they love to live in the Black Hills. Do you know what they love, amici? Cowboys and Indians. In fact, the one looking down, Vincenzo, <laughs> he thinks he's an Indian. Oh, he wants to ride every horse he sees. I become blood brother with Chief Black Elk. Yes, my boys become blood brothers with the sons of the chief. And they teach my son Vincenzo to ride a horse. Borlam says, now you could ride my horse, Vincenzo. And my boy, look, he's so happy. These are the men who I teach to carve their faces. They are my brothers too, you know? But do you think these men are artists like Luigi? No, these men work underground in the coal mine, in the silver mine. Very dangerous work, Amici. But then the depression comes and these men have no work. So Mr. Borlam, he does something crazy. He hires these men and I have to teach them how to carve. Impossible. But these men are very smart. These men are very brave. These men are very strong. And together, I teach them to carve the faces, and they become like my brothers. I meet this president. He shakes my hand. You know what he says? He says, Adel Bianco, is, uh, is that the uh, Italian? <laughs> and I say, 100%. Look at these faces. 60 feet tall each face, huh? The nose, 21 feet long. The mouth, 18 feet wide. Let's look at Mount Rushmore before the faces are there. The first thing we must do is point. This is a five foot model of George Washington. Do you see the pole sticking out of the head, Amici, and the string that comes down? There is a weight at the bottom of that string. This is called a pointing machine. And my job is to measure a specific point on the small face, maybe the tip of the nose. Huh? Then I take that point, that measurement, and I transfer it in a ratio of 1 to 12, 5 feet, 60 feet, to the mountain with a big pointing machine. And I move that point and it gives me an idea of how much stone to remove. You have to be perfect when you point. Next, we blast. We take off 85% of the stone on Mount Rushmore with dynamite. We have to be perfect when we blast. Once you blast it off, you cannot put it back. Huh? Then we drill. 
Look at the men. They are drilling down, down, down to within maybe three inches of each measured point. And you see President Washington, he slowly comes to life. And now we honeycomb. I am drilling holes very close together because it gives me more control when I break off those holes and that takes us to the finished part of the face. And then we finish. I am on the mountain, and they bring down to me on a cable a five-foot mask of Abraham Lincoln. On the other side is the 60-foot face. I am now chief carver. I use the talent in my hands to study the small face and finish the big face with all its expression. And Amici, when I am done, it looks a little like this. This is Mount Rushmore. I'm going to show you the original model. Though Mr. Borlam wanted it to look. Amici, why did we not carve the body below the face? Because the stone below the face is called pegmatite stone. Pegmatite stone is filled with crystals like mica and quartz. When you try to carve stone with crystals inside, ba-boom, the stone, it falls apart. So we decide to just carve the faces can you see the beginning of the body of Washington? Do you see the beginning of the fist of Lincoln? But we had to stop because of pegmatite stone. Did you know President Jefferson was supposed to be the first face on the mountain? We hit the pegmatite stone, mica quartz, the face it falls apart. We have a big problem, but we don't give up. We take dynamite and we blast off the bad face and we put Mr. Jefferson on the other side of Mr. Washington, where you see him today. I am carving the lip of President Jefferson. One day, Amici, I am home in Port Chester. I have my wine. I get a phone call from my boss, Mr. Borlam, and he says, Bianco, you must come to the mountain subito. There is a dangerous crack of pegmatite stone in the lip. It grows and it grows, and I trust only you can fix it. And I walk up those 700 stick steps, Amici, and I take out that bad crack, and I put in a new piece of stone, and I carve it, and I finish it, and Amici, when I am done, you cannot even tell the crack was there. This is my passion, to be an artiste. Let's have a big hand for my grandpa, Luigi Del Bianco, Chief Carver on Mount Rush. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, my grandfather was an artist, but he was like all of our ancestors. He was a humble, hardworking immigrant, and so he carved 500 headstones by hand in our local cemetery. He was so proud to be American, but he never forgot his roots. He went back to Italy many times to Maduno in the province of Pordenone in Friuli. My grandfather was honored by the National Sculpture Society for his work as a stone carver. This is a bust of my uncle Silvio, mosaic of Abraham Lincoln. You'll see that he was inspired by Rushmore because here's a bust now. Incredible. George Washington, Teddy Roosevelt, motherhood. See this book? This is the uh, most definitive book about the carving of Mount Rushmore written by Rex Allen Smith in 1985. My grandfather isn't mentioned once. I could still remember my Uncle Caesar slamming the tables and saying, hey, that's like talking about the Yankees and not mentioning DiMaggio. And I think he was right. And seeing how upset my uncle was brought me back to that connection to me and my grandpa. I am Luigi, you are Luigi. So my uncle and I decided to find out the truth because obviously history does not tell you the whole story all the time. It started out with my first pilgrimage to Mount Rushmore in 1988. This is a plaque of all 400 workers who worked on the mountain, starting from laborers to drillers to secretaries to the man who put the soul into the faces of the president. So my Uncle Caesar and I decided to do a little research to find the truth. This is uh, a letter that Borglum wrote to the Mount Rushmore Commission when he first hired my grandfather in 1933. He was complaining about the way his chief carver was being treated. We discovered that my grandfather quit Mount Rushmore two to three times because of bullying, harassment, and his life being made miserable. Borglum continues to say, he is worth any three men I could find in America for this particular type of work here and now. He entirely outclassed everyone on the hill, and his knowledge was an embarrassment to their amateur efforts and lack of knowledge. 
He is the only man besides myself who has been on the work, who knows the problems and how to solve them. The loss of Bianco will probably prevent the finishing of the Washington and Jefferson heads this year. Well, Borglum has to get his Chief Carver back. So he makes a deal with the Mount Rushmore Commission. He says, I've decided we must keep Bianco and keep him happy. You pay him $10 a day, I will pay the remainder out of my own pocket. Borglum took a second mortgage out on his house to do this. His ability to understand is much more important to this work. So the good news is my grandfather stays for the seasons of 1933, 34, 35, 36, 37, doing incredible work on the mountain, finishing the faces, and teaching the men to carve. Unfortunately, at the end of 1937, my grandfather vows never to come again. And Borglum writes, for the purpose of Washington's red tape, a portion of our better men are designated as carvers. There are no carvers on the mountain. There has never been but one. And he refused to return because of the chronic sabotage directed at him. 1938, 39 go by, no Bianco. The faces have been left untouched. Borglum is beyond desperate. He writes a letter in 1940 saying, Dear Bianco, I wish you would come as soon as you can if you want to be of help to me. I must finish the faces by the 1st of July, and all of them, I need you. Your pay will be exactly what it was before. You are the only man who was on that pay. Well, obviously, my grandfather does not respond to this letter because a second letter comes stating, my dear Bianco, you better be here by May 1st. <laughs> you will have to work for me, and nobody else will trouble you. Well, fortunately, my grandfather returns. And he's the only man working on the faces in 1940 for the whole season. And why do I know that? Because Richard Sarazani wrote a beautiful book that includes his father, Arthur, who worked with my grandfather during that season. And in his journal, Arthur writes, the place is as silent as a tomb. There is only one man working on the faces, and that is Bianco. At the end of my grandfather's life, he had this to say. I do it again knowing all the hardships involved. I would work at Rushmore even without pay if necessary. It was a great privilege granted me. You could imagine how excited my uncle and I were when we presented 75 primary source documents to the National Park Service, specifically to the staff at Mount Rushmore, excited that he, my grandfather would finally get his plaque. Do you know what the uh, staff at Mount Rushmore's response was to those primary source documents? Well, that's very nice, but your grandfather was not the chief carver. He is part of a group called the Workers. He will be credited within that group. No one will be singled out. Do you know that we've been sharing those documents with every staff member from the superintendent down to park ranger for 25 years, getting the same response as if a script had been written and passed to every successor? But then this guy came along, Cam Sholly. He did something that nobody else was willing to do and should have done. And when he was finished, we finally changed the historical record for good. And uh, those historians that went through those uh, documents with me that Cam Sholly uh, brought to my house, they encouraged me to write a book, and the book is available today. It's called Out of Rushmore Shadow, the Luigi Del Bianco story. Uh, it's also available in Italian. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri, and we want to wish you all a happy holiday season. E arrivederci all'anno prossimo. See you next year. <laughs>